let's say we have a complex function f of z that's piecewise continuous on some curve or contour c that can be either open or closed. By the way, when I talk about a piecewise continuous function, I mean a function that has a finite number of discontinuities inside c and doesn't go to infinity anywhere inside c. So if this is my curve c, then this would be an acceptable piecewise continuous function. Anyway, suppose also that on the contour c, the magnitude of f of z has an upper limit m. Recall that by magnitude I mean the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. Remember, a function of a complex number is also a complex number, so it's going to have both a real and imaginary part. Now if both of these conditions are true, that f is a piecewise continuous function on c and has an upper bound on its magnitude m on c, and if the contour c has a length l, then the magnitude of the integral of f of z over the contour c is less than or equal to the upper bound m times the curve length l. This whole theorem with the three conditions and this inequality statement is called the estimation lemma. You can also call it the ML inequality theorem. Anyway, let's get to the proof by first demonstrating an initial result. We'll call this a lemma, which is kind of like a mini proof that's used as a stepping stone to something bigger. According to this lemma, if w is some complex function of t that's piecewise continuous on the interval from a to b, then the magnitude of the integral of w from a to b is less than or equal to the integral of the magnitude of w from a to b. To prove this lemma, let's set the integral of w of t from a to b to some complex number given by r0 times the exponential of i theta0. Since this exponential term just has a magnitude of 1, because it's only made up of a cosine and a sine, I can also write r0 as the magnitude of the integral from a to b of w of t dt, if I just take the magnitude of both sides. Recall that r0 times the exponential of i theta0 is the polar representation of a complex number, where instead of writing x plus y i, I write the complex number in polar form. Now once we have this, let's divide both sides by the exponential to isolate r0. In general, the integral on the right hand side is a complex number as well, so we can break it up into real and imaginary components. Notice that on the left hand side, the number r0 is a real number. It's the distance from the origin. As a result, this imaginary part will disappear because the right hand side must equal the left, and the right hand side can only have a real number. If we do the simplification, here's what we're left with. And let's work on this integral a little bit. I'm going to write this whole function as u of t. u of t is also a complex function, so it has a real and imaginary part to it. Which means that its integral is just the integral of its real part plus the integral of its imaginary part. But the integral of u of t is also a complex number, and we can write it as the sum of its real and imaginary parts. And if we compare these two expressions, then we'll see that the real part of the integral of u must equal the integral of the real part of u. So essentially, we can move the real part operation into and outside the integral freely. So let's use this to go back to the expression for r0 and move the real part back inside the integral because we just showed that we're allowed to do that. Let's now substitute the magnitude of the integral of w back in place of the r0. Now because we're integrating on a real interval where a is less than b, the integral of the real part of the exponential of negative i theta naught times w of t is obviously going to be less than or equal to the integral of the magnitude of the exponential of negative i theta naught times w of t, since the magnitude also adds the imaginary part, so it's got to be greater than just the real part alone. Now the magnitude of the products is just the product of the magnitudes here. But as we found earlier, the magnitude of the exponential is just 1, meaning that 
the magnitude of the integral from a to b of w of t dt is less than or equal to the integral from a to b of the magnitude of w of t dt, which is exactly what we wanted to prove with this lemma. So now that we've proven the lemma, let's get to actually showing the ML inequality. We'll start with the magnitude of the contour integral of f of z over the curve c, so the left-hand side of the ML inequality. What we can do now is parametrize the curve c. In other words, we're going to describe the curve c by a function z of t, where t is a parameter that varies from a lower limit a to an upper limit b. Now because this contour integral is over the curve c, the only possible values that my complex variable z can take on lie on the curve c. So what we can do is just plug in z of t for the z in my contour integral. Since the integral is now with respect to t, let's change the limits and the differential accordingly. And that's pretty simple, just use the chain rule on the differential to write it as dz by dt times dt and just change the limits from t equals a to t equals b. And this is what you'll end up with, the magnitude of the integral from a to b of f of z of t times dz by dt dt. Now comes the time to use that lemma we showed earlier. All we do is use this f of z of t times dz by dt as our function of t, so the magnitude of the integral of this is less than or equal to the integral of the magnitude. Note that we can apply the lemma mainly because f of z is piecewise continuous on c, which is specified in the statement of the ML inequality theorem. Now, let's look further at this function inside the integral. We already know from the theorem statement that f of z has an upper bound m on the contour c, so naturally this magnitude of f of z of t times dz dt would equal the magnitude of the two functions separately, which would be less than or equal to m times the absolute value or the magnitude of dz by dt because of this upper bound m. Now because the magnitude of f of z of t times dz by dt is less than or equal to m times the magnitude of dz by dt, the integral of the magnitude of f of z of t times dz by dt is less than or equal to the integral of m times the magnitude of dz by dt. Just move the m outside because it's a constant and we end up with the integral over c of f of z dz is less than or equal to m times the integral from a to b of the absolute value of dz by dt times dt. Now this is rather obvious if the contour integral magnitude of f of z is equal to this guy which is less than or equal to this guy which is less than or equal to m times the integral of dz by dt then the contour integral magnitude of f of z is less than or equal to m times the integral of dz by dt. That's just a common sense property of numbers. Finally, we know that if we just change back the variables of integration from t to z, the integral of dz dt over t can just be rewritten as the integral of dz over the contour c, but that's just the arc length of c. So therefore, the magnitude of the contour integral of f of z is less than or equal to the upper bound m times the contour length l, and that proves the ml inequality. Let's do a short example just to drive the point home. I can do more complicated examples if people want, but I don't know if they're going to add a lot of instructional value. But let me know in the comments anyway. In this example, we want to find the upper bound on the magnitude of the contour integral of 1 over z, and the contour here is c, which is the arc of a circle which runs from z equals 2 to z equals 2i. Now this function that we're integrating is piecewise continuous on c, so we can use the ML inequality to establish the upper bound on the integral, which is just m times the contour length l. l is pretty easy to find, it's just the radius of the circle, which c is an arc of, times the angle subtended by the arc. The radius of the circle is obviously 2, while the angle subtended is pi by 2, 90 degrees, so l would just be pi. M, on the other hand, is the upper bound of the function being contour integrated. So it's the upper bound on the magnitude of 1 over z on the contour c. Now because the contour c is part of a circle of radius 2, that means the magnitude of z on the contour is just 2. And therefore the upper bound m on the magnitude of 1 over z 
is just 1 over 2. So by the ML inequality, the upper bound on the magnitude of the contour integral of 1 over z is just pi times 1 over 2, which is pi by 2. And we're done. Just a couple of things to mention before I end this video. The first thing is that the ML inequality should not be used to approximate the contour integral's magnitude. It's just a guideline that establishes an upper bound. The upper bound doesn't have to be close to the actual value of the integral because it's just an upper bound. The second thing is that for this example, you can actually perform this contour integral and find its magnitude, which will turn out to be 1 over the square root of 2, and that's less than the upper bound we found of pi by 2. And that's just a verification of the ML inequality if you need it. Anyway, that does it for this video. If you enjoyed the lesson and want more, please like and subscribe, and be sure to check out my other videos on complex variables. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.